Okay, good morning and uh, welcome to session five. Uh, before we, we begin, I will just love that we say a word of prayers so that the Holy Spirit should guide us through. Let us pray. Dear Father God, we want to thank you again so much for another privilege to be in your presence, to listen to you. And uh, we pray that Heavenly Father, this lesson today, lesson five, that you open up our hearts and ears, that Father, we will perceive what you have for us today. Pray that let Lord God Almighty, in the midst of all the session, that you will rekindle your spirit in us. That Father will see where we we supposed to improve, so that we put everything into practice, so that Lord we will relate well with each other, and your church, oh God, shall be sustained, and we'll be able to do the things that you call us to do. Lord, I submit myself this time under your leadership. So take control, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So we last time we talked about uh, this unity and. Uh, it is it is really not going to be healthy or fair if we talk about unity and we don't talk about the things that cause this unity in our church and to see the various areas where conflicts arises what i have today actually it, it, it is just a tip of the iceberg because if we were to sit and try to exploit digitally everything that actually causes conflict or disunity in the church then we may want to schedule months because there are just so many so what i'm trying to say is that there are so many things that actually causes a uh, conflict in the church but i've limited today uh just limited myself to the areas that i i really want to touch uh, touch today so as we we get into it i just want us to uh to look ourselves as we we drive through church for the reason of the of the project uh, because if we were to go into the things that actually cause this unity in the church are just so 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 many and if right now I can give us the opportunity to each one person to list what do you think uh, so let, let us do it this way let us go around you know to your own understanding of what, what do you think is the reason uh, some of the reasons that actually causes this unity in the church or conflict in the church we'll start from the left if you don't mind sir Clicks. Clicks. That is one. Causes this in the church. Todd? Uh, I'll, I'll answer as G.K. Chesterton once answered. He uh, was responded to a London Times uh, uh, request for essays. Uh, and the, uh, the title that you're supposed to write on is What's Wrong With This World? And he wrote back in a, in a two word essay I am. I am. Yeah. I right. Am. I am what's wrong with this world. So yeah. if, if I, I ask, am. you know, what causes this unity in the church, it's, well, it's me. It's him too. Yeah. But first and foremost, it's me. I'm, you know, each individual. It's just me, my kingdom. That's right. My, my, my uh, preferences, my desires, my unwillingness to let loose of me and surrender to the Lord's leadership, mm -hmm. and then demand the accountability of that amongst my brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. If you ask me what's wrong with the church, it's me. That's right. That's right. Yes, Dale. I've been real fortunate to serve some churches that had really sweet unity within the church. <clears throat> but um, <clears throat> most of the time the, there's been disunity has been due to finances. Mm -hmm. um, and I worked, I worked for a few years in a, a, a secular job uh, and one of the top guys there, he, he had a famous statement. He said, well, in our profession, if it's, if it's not about the money, then it's about the money. It's always about the money. And even that even translates into a uh, church setting, you know. Uh, we've had issues here at Broadway with that kind of, what, you know, if, if it's not about the money, then right. right now it turns out to be about the money. Right. Uh, right. Finances. Zach? I think. You know, sometimes you know this is not an exhaustive list of things. Right. The only thing that this one came to my mind is a lot of times it's just a matter of spiritual immaturity. Immaturity. Yeah, spiritual immaturity. That's true. Very good. Hey, Jennifer, anything? Well, I think they covered it. Uh, the spiritual immaturity, the, the lack of willingness to put others first. 
um, and Father Self. Yeah, that's right, right? Greek, self, me, I, me, mine. What, what, what pleases me? How it look in my own way? Yeah. yeah. Okay, Cheryl? Um, I think probably now, uh, you know, people talking and, you know, just. Yeah. So can we say gossiping too? I think probably the men. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we don't control our mouth. No, this is true. Seriously, all these things. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. This, are, this, are all these things actually they count. These are things that actually causes the division in the church. Yeah. What's your class that you prefer? Class, click. I belong to this class. Oh my! I belong to this social class. I am educated like this. I you know, class. That's a bad. Yeah. All, all these are right. One more. We haven't talked. About, I think um, a common clarity. A lot of folks have no clue what the purpose of church even is. That is what, true. What are we? That is true. Why are we here? And you go back to what you said earlier yeah. that me is I am me. You know, because the truth is that if we don't understand why we are here in church, we don't know the reason what the church is all about and the reason that we come to church for. Then all these things will actually fit in and it will destroy us. Okay. So as we get into it, there are some few. Some wise sayings, some few sayings. Uh, have you ever heard this saying that when two elephants fight, the grass around suffers? I don't know the author. <laughs> when two elephants fight, the grass around actually suffers, right? Imagine the situation of conflict where, where there is a division, we're fighting in the church. What about the people who, don't, who are not strong in faith? What about those who are struggling to join the church? And they come and see that, okay, these are people who have been in the church for who knows when, many, many years, right? And if they are fighting in each, with each other in the church, what about me? I'm just struggling to stand to get myself stand as a Christian. What do you think? We had a situation, she can testify this way. Uh, in Cameroon, there's some two. Oh, should I say this? No, okay. For the sake of covering people's identity, right? I, do, I will not say this because it's really beautiful. <laughs> but when two people, when, when there's conflict in a church, Sometimes we may not understand what actually is happening in the spiritual because we're actually distorting the move of the Holy Spirit in that church. When we fight both of us, you know, people actually suffer, especially those who are not Christians, and those who are struggling to be Christians. Here's another one. This is from uh, Lauren Cunningham. I don't know him very well, but when I was reading through, I saw this quotation, it was very, very good. He says that, he says, disagreement don't cause disunity, a lack of forgiveness does. Do we agree with that? We are unique people, we are diverse people, we have different opinions. It is not actually the disagreement that actually causes us to divide, but the lack of forgiveness. If we don't come, and forgiveness is what? You must, you must try, you must, before you forgive somebody, you must come to a level of compromise before you forgive somebody. That for the sake of Christ, well, I forgive you, right? So disagreement actually is not a really, really cause of unity, it is the lack of forgiveness. That causes us to be divided or to be disunited in the church. What does James say? James says that what is the source of wars and fights among you? Don't they come from your passions that wage war within you? I know this passage most of the time, uh, like those of us who do counseling, we usually apply this in the course of marriage, within during the context of marriage. But we can use this also in the context of disunity in the church because. If we want to sample the reason actually why people actually uh, uh, disagree in the church is because people have their personal desires, like we all have contributed. People have their personal desires and their personal ego, whereby if things don't come the way they want it to come, then that's a problem because they want everything to look as like their own eyes. But a church of God, should it function that way? A church of God is not an establishment. It's not a business. It's not uh, uh, somebody's business where they can run it the way they want, okay? I don't think it is that way. If it were somebody's private business, <laughs> yeah, you can, you can do it the way you want to be and, and do whatever you want and let it go the way you want because that's your business. But the church of God is not like that. So the source of wars and fights amongst us comes as a result of our evil passions, our passion, the things that we want, them, we want to be done in our own way. Now, when looking at conflicts in our church, I want us to consider this, this the following four facts. That failure to resolve conflicts causes disunity. Failure, if we fail to resolve, even in marriage, 
even a body body friendship any relationship that you find yourself inside the moment you fail you refuse to resolve conflict it will cause to disunity because the crack will be widening gradually and before you know it the apartness is very wide that it cannot be mended anymore secondly conflict comes package as people conflict does not the devil uses individual the devil does not come and present himself and tell that oh i'm the devil i'm the evil one i've come to do this the devil uses who he uses people like us like me like you who was who who whom did the devil use to get jesus christ was it not judas the right hand man it was a person right so even the closest your closest inner circle person can uh, can be that medium that the devil can use to inject conflict in the garden People, not parts, start conflict. Conflict has been started by people, right? With people start conflict, not the parts that we follow, but the people, people actually they start conflict. And lastly, I want us to also, as we look at, at conflict, let's also uh, understand that people, not parts, are the ones who make peace. So as much as it is people who causes conflict, so too it is people that makes peace, that resolve conflicts. So what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that there is going to be conflict whenever people gather. But because there is conflict, we also, we who cause the conflict, actually, we have the ability to resolve the conflict. Does running away from conflict solve a problem? It does not solve a problem. Does ignoring conflict it solve a problem? It does not, don't, does shine away, cause, uh, solve any, any conflict, any problem? It does not. It just instead it layers up to the point where when the weight because the pressure becomes so high, then the next will what? But devastation, disaster, or crash, right? So as Christians, we are called to to handle our conflict, to make peace with each other. We are we are called to resolve conflict, to make peace with each other. Then now let's try to crack the knot. Now what causes conflict actually? The most important thing that causes conflict in any setting, in any group, in any relationship, is our desires. James chapter 4, 1 talks about it. It's our desires. Our desires, either we are pressing our desires so bad, either our desires, we want our desires to just to be the way that we want it to be without considering the desires of other people. Our desires may be good and some may be bad. Okay, so... This is 1 Matthew chapter 15 where Christ quoted, he said, but what comes out of the mouth? Now we're trying to look at, talking about desires, look at what you have in your hand. Because desires are things that you're craving for, you desire, you want it to happen. And most of those things are being nursed in our thoughts. So Jesus Christ says in Matthew chapter 15, 18, 19, he says that, but what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart. And this defiles a person. For from the heart, now, this is what actually the heart produces now, from our desires. These are the fruit of the desires that actually come from our hearts. Now, quoting this, I'm not saying that we are having, this is what we do here. I'm not trying to say that this is actually what is going on, on here, but I'm talking about the kinds of desires that we have in our, that people have in their heart. Some may be good desires, like I said, and some may be very bad desires. And this is what Christ quotes to, uh, uh, in this passage. He says that, for from the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adultery, sexual morality, theft, false testimony, slander, like some, like some people come and they have already have some preconceived idea. And sometimes they click. Again, somebody mentioned click. Sometimes they click, they form their opinion, they start, okay, this is, we are going to that meeting. This is where we stand. That is destructive. They are coming into a meeting when they have had a already meeting. So their, their desire, they say, okay, we are going to this meeting. This is what we are going to do. I will stand on this. And when they come down, they are, they are having a business meeting. You find a click just single eye themselves. And I've been in such meetings before. And you find that the, this this group of people who are standing on the same on, on one idea, they are looking at each other. When when it's usually we are Baptist, we are democratic. That's what we say, right? Most of our things, most of the time, it wrongfully result into voting, because sometimes our our casting of our votes and making decision through the voting does not really solve the problem. Because uh, sometimes the decision that we arrive at is not what aligns with Scripture, you know. So people come out themselves and form a clique, and when they come now, they. They raise their hand and make the majority just to demand push in their demand because they want it it must be this way and some say that we've been in this church for a long time we have been doing it this way okay this is what we understand how can you want to change things like that 
That is a demanding desire, and it destroys the church. It brings disunity. It's not good. Then also, this demand quickly it morphs into a dictatorial demand with godlike expectation. Others must serve you and meet your desire, or it must be my own way, or else I leave the church, or else I do this, or else I do that. That's not a good spirit, right? When we have demanding desires, actually, it, it brings disunity in the church. Damning desires. You talk about demanding. This is damning desires. This is where I have the best taste of things. It has to, it must be the one that I pick. My my I have a skill of making good selection and making good choices of things. What do you have to say about let me give an example? Want to let's say want to buy a curtain for this room, right? And they form a committee. Um, whatever committee, they form a committee, and, and there is somebody in that committee who has this kind of damning desires. Well, uh, since I'm heading this committee, I know the best choice of what material must be in this church. It will match this color because I have this kind of training. So that even when the committee is sitting to plan things, to say, okay, well, I think because of course white, maybe we'll go with this. That person is pushing. No, you, mine is, this is, this is, what do you know? I know best. They push like, this is a kind of damning desire. Your desire is, you you override other people else's desire. Now look at what, what a, uh, James 4 11 says, He says, Speak not evil one to another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother, speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. Thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. We have a damning attitude that mine it must be mine. You don't know how to do this. No, you, 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 Pastor Prison, I remember we talked about it yesterday, very wonderful. That, you know, we are so spiritualized sometimes in our churches, in our congregations, so that when we, we, we tend to label people, we say, okay, if it is this one who wants to talk, no, this one can never say something. No, what good can come from this person? No, this, the Holy Spirit cannot use this person. The Holy Spirit can use only this one who is well-educated, well-qualified, and speak very eloquently. That's how we do in our churches, right? That is wrong. That is a damning, damning desire. We are damning a fellow brother, damning a fellow sister. In our, in our church, and all this it leads uh, to disunity. Then the, the third one is uh, we have divided allegiances. This is very, very critical in our church. Not only this church, but so many churches today. We choose which leader we will obey over the other one. We said, No, in the staff in the church, I prefer this person because I get along so easily with this person, and the others you turn your back away from them. We, 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 when the church members direct their loyalties toward a particular person rather than to the church, rather than to Christ, that brings division. It is very terrible. You know, because you are related somehow with this person, no, and this person is here in, 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 this, in this church staff meeting, in the leadership, no. Whenever this person talks, you act. But when somebody also stands and says the same thing, you don't make as if somebody has really spoken anything yet. You don't consider that person to be anything because you don't tie with that person. That is wrong. That is wrong. It's, not, it's not healthy for the church. Allegiance from around certain prominent members or families in the church. Yeah, we, being Baptists, uh, <laughs> we, we've had situations where we, God has blessed some families in the church and they always, you know, financially they do very, very good contributions. And when it comes to position the church, like when they want to, during time that they are looking for, uh, trying to get membership, the, uh, uh, filling in positions in the church, people always want to look at them because they feel that money is everything in the church. They don't really consider their spiritual stance, right? Uh, they have become so influential that whenever there is any gathering, if they are not there, then nothing will happen. Whenever there is any meeting in the church, if these particular family members who are so uh, influenced and affluent, if they are not there, then things will not happen. That is wrong. That is wrong. If our church depends on, we give allegiance, we form our allegiance on prominent members or families in the church, then where is Christ's seat? Where is the seat of Jesus Christ in the church? A church is Christ's church. It's not a human church. We thank God that God brings people to bless the church, to bless the community. But it becomes so bad when we unseat Christ in his seat and try to give glory back to man because of the affluence. We have divided allegiance to programs, events, projects, and ministries. Now, permit me to say this. This was this era, this is one of the eras that 
um, uh, Dutch men in our church here, seriously. How is it that in a church of God, that serves one God, a church that has one program, on a Wednesday when there is a Bible study, Bible teaching meeting, you expect that everybody in that church should be in that Bible study meeting that is organized by the church. But at the same time, again, excuse me, I'm not standing on somebody's story yet, but I just have to say it. When the church has a Bible study here, church Bible study, like on a Wednesday, at the same time, you have rumba. What is rumba? They're dancing somewhere, the same meeting. You have some other different activity, or you, wow, it, it is not right. The church has to have one program. All our the church allegiance should be one. Everybody who comes to church, our allegiance as per uh, the programs and the events and projects and ministries, he has to align with what the church has and is offering. And this has brought a lot of conflicts to so many churches. Another thing to this is that I don't think that in a church, anybody just has to just come at any time and just bring anything and just do in a church. No. A church has an organizational uh, chart where the head is the pastor, he's the under shepherd. Christ, then the, the pastor, well, our church here, we don't have uh, uh, elders. We have board of deacons, but we have, uh, I don't know what our organizational chart in this, in this church is, but I think that we have Christ, we have the pastor who is the under shepherd, then maybe they have the board of deacons, and then we have uh, uh, other staff and, you know, just how we spread out. But there's, there's a level of leadership that has to be. Nobody should just, I don't think it is a healthy thing for our church that, like, if I have a program today, I should not even care about the church authority. I should not care about the pastor. I don't care about the pastoral staff and anybody. I just come and just organize my own people in the church. Say, oh, come on, we have this going on in the church. <clears throat> it is wrong. It's not healthy. God's house is not a house of disorderliness. That is why there is, the God has called a pastor to be the head of the church. And every program that has to come to the church, it has to first of all pass through, pass through the head of the church. And who is the head of the church? The under shepherd as the pastor. He has a right and a mandate as a servant of God and an, as someone that is leading that church spiritually to see and oversee any program. What if he just allow and somebody is bringing a different doctrine and teaching the church? What if he just allow anything and, and something to just come and do their own different thing that does not tie with the mission and the vision of the church? Do we see that? So it is all our religion has to be according to the plan of the church. Very important also that we should consider the church at Corinth. Now we saw this in, in Corinth, the church actually was divided over different religions. Okay, Paul talked about this. Some say they are Paul and some say they are Apollo. Some say they believe in, uh, in Peter and some say are Christ. But when you read that first Corinthians chapter 10, you see at the end that Paul will ask them, who is Apollo and who is Paul? Means that all those people that don't matter, the person that actually matters is who? It's Jesus Christ. So everything that a church we are doing, we are doing for the to give glory and it is God, it is Jesus Christ. We are doing to serve God and Him should we glorify and Him should we honor. Then this is very also very important, uh, authority issues. You know, uh, this is hard to say because um, and so many churches, so many of our churches today, um, we have elderly people who actually despise younger people in authority. For instance, a, so the pastor is a, is, is a young guy. Um, we have the habit of saying, ah, what can he say? They despise his leadership, they despise his authority. I will find when the pastor's given, I'm not, I'm just, this lesson, I'm, I'm, very being, I'm just being very honest because if I don't be very honest, it will defeat the purpose of why this project is being implemented here. Okay, so I really have to say what's supposed to be said. Not giving a favor somewhere or standing somewhere. No, I'm just saying it the way it's supposed to be said. Um, on that authority issues, challenge over the right authority. Now, who put you in authority? It is God, right? It's Christ. When we challenge the one that God has put in authority, are we challenging that person? We are challenging Christ. We are challenging Christ, right? Who are we serving here? We're serving God, right? How come we come to serve God and be challenging God again to the person that he has put authority to look over us spiritually? Do, do we see that? People take this very lightly. Where I come from, where we come from, we respect our authorities. 
we respect our pastors, we respect our leaders in the church because we know that those people, God has put them over us, God has put them in authority over us. I don't care how old, old I might be or how wealthy I might be or how knowledgeable I might, be, I might be more than whoever my pastor is, as long as he is my pastor and I worship and I remember in that church, he is my spiritual father, he is my spiritual guide, I look up unto him. There is only one thing that will take me out of that circle. It is if it's not preaching from the word. If it's not preaching what the word says. But as long as I sit under his voice, as long as I sit under that church, then he is my spiritual guide, my spiritual father. Then we have to follow him as, um, as he is the under shepherd. We need to follow him. It brings this, this uh, being disunity in the church and it brings conviction in God's house. If we don't respect or if we challenge authority, I don't think challenging authority in the church is, is something that somebody wants to dare to do because you're challenging God and who can stand the wrath of the Lord? Nobody. But also, now looking at that, um, the challenge over, uh, over the right authority, members speak and choose whom they will obey and whom they think is, is, is the true authority. That is wrong in the church of God. It is wrong. The abuse of authority. Well, also, <laughs> we've had situations where uh, the authority don't execute their duties the way they're supposed to. They don't consult. Uh, they feel that they are just like the Alpha and Omega. Because they are there, nobody else matters. They just do whatever they want they feel they do. And they just say whatever they want to say. I am the boss. I am in charge. That's what they say. Right? That is also wrong. We have to balance things out. That is also wrong. Okay, that's an abuse of authority. If we look to, if we look, if you read in Mark chapter 20, 25 to 28, where you will see that Jesus actually was emphasizing on the temptation that churches actually face when they are in authority. So calling being an authority in the church is not a, it's not a child's play, it's something very, very serious. Because we all gonna we have to give an account to God because He placed us in that position. Okay. Then uh, another problem of, of the authority issue in the church is failure to exercise authority. This is when there is no church discipline. There are churches who have been in churches where uh, pregnancy without marriage is okay. And they come and even celebrate, they do a baby shower in the church when somebody is not, uh, a, 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 one member of the church is pregnant. They don't even discipline nothing, they don't even talk about it. Yet yeah, they, they, they're holding a baby shower in the church. Condoning with everything is going in the church. You find a church where there is immorality going on, yet the church, the leadership, they know, but they're not doing anything. Discipline is very, very necessary, and it is right and supposed to be practiced in a church where it's uh, 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 necessary. Because the Bible talks about, about authority, about church, uh, uh, church discipline. So when the church authority fails to execute their duty of, of discipline, then it will be a confused environment where people will do whatever they want. After all, you didn't do this, they didn't do this to this person, I can do it and go get my way also. You know, and it becomes very complicated and difficult if we don't do it to A, and when B also falls in the same situation, you will not be able to do it to B because if you knew about A, you never did to A. Why would you want to do it to B and C and D? And that's where the church of God collapses. Well, there are just so many ways how to resolve conflict in the church, but these are just very few that I picked up. And uh, the first thing, honestly, uh, J James 5 actually gives us a prescription. He says that confessing our sins one to another, address everyone involved. And when, we, when we're doing this, in the case of resolving conflict, when doing this, everybody involved has to be addressed. You have to avoid if, we have to admit specifically, yes, I did this. We have to accept the consequences of what you do action. We have to alter then we have to alter our behavior. In the course of in the course of uh, confessing our sins to one another, we have to alter our behavior after having forgiven. When you acknowledge that okay, this is what you did that was wrong and, and you'll be reproved or corrected for that, then you have to your behavior has to change as a child of God. And then we need to genuinely ask for forgiveness and also we need to give forgiveness. 
Then also we need to grant true forgiveness. Matthew chapter 6, 12 to, to, to 15 talks about granting uh, true forgiveness. I like, as a matter of fact, that uh, Matthew chapter 6, I think verse 14 and 15 said that if you don't, well, verse 12 talks about uh, God forgiving us our sins. Uh, 14, I think 14 talks about if you don't forgive somebody, don't expect forgiveness from God. So the prerequisite, the prerequisite to receive forgiveness from God, it means that you also have to forgive somebody and forgive genuinely too and reasonably too. Okay. Uh, then also Galatians 6, we talk about looking out for the interests of others. We must resolve conflict. Then Galatians 6, we tell us to bear one another's burden as Jesus did for us. We have to regard for each other. Then of course, we have to really practice church discipline where necessary. Church discipline, some of the few passages that I print out or pick out from the church discipline is uh, 2 Corinthians 2, 6 to 8, Titus 12, 15, 2 Thessalonians 3, 14, and Revelation 2, 2. It talks about uh, a, a, a church discipline. Then, of course, the last one is we have to seek for recon reconciliation and engage through the process of keys. We have to seek for reconciliation. The Bible says that if it is dependent on, make peace with, 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 with everybody that is, it depends on you. So we need to seek peace. So in order for us to be united, to stay united, in, in order for us to, to move on together as a team in our church, we, we need to acknowledge and identify that there are conflicts, conflicts they do arise, they do exist. We need to know the areas of conflicts and we need to know how to resolve our conflicts very fast before it carries us to, to another level where we are unbearable and very destructive. Question? Before question, Chris, you have something to say. Yeah, the passage on Mark, I think you meant, you said Mark chapter 20, but I think you meant Matthew chapter 20. Oh, okay. So, I think that was a, that yeah. was a mistake. I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Most of our churches have not taught spiritual authority. Most of our pastors are doing feel good sermons and not preaching the Word of God and not challenging the people from the Word of God. We need that. We need Amen. those. Mm -hmm. We need those. One thing I was kind of thinking about um, is, you know, what would you say about, you know, situations where, you know, maybe there's a little bit of conflict, but uh, both parties or one party, they overlook the sin. So, you know, that's something, you know, that we should do as believers. There are times when maybe a conflict doesn't become a real big thing. It remains small and, you know, the parties they overlook this, which I think is a good thing, and, and yeah, I, I think that goes along with being at peace with everyone, and uh, then Proverbs 19, uh, 19, 11, uh good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. So, I, I, you know, it's kind of the other end of the conflict, uh, where, where we see people, before we let something get out of hand, you know, people who desire unity sometimes it's just a matter of, if we just overlook it, it's water under the bridge, and we move on. I don't know if you have any comments on that or... I have two things I have to say. You know, um, so, before I say it, let me say something that somebody spoke to me and it marked me so much. It says that um, if you have, um, say, um, a growth that has to be incised, and, it had, and the growth actually your body it has a uh, let's say porous inside. The doctor needs to incise it and press out everything. Now, do you just have to take an ornament, apply on top of it, and let it the pain, the little pain to to get over it, or will you really go and ask the doctor to, for them to incise it and pull so that it, remove the so the the cause of the pain inside? You know, there is what they call a you may surely want just to. Uh, 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 do what is it window dressing as you say or you actually do the exact thing so what, I, what I'm saying is this is that listen you know the devil actually has a way to get us and most of the time he starts by little things like that um, if we don't address those things small small things and we just this you know just try to put them under the, the bridge and it will lay out it will accumulate to the point where sometimes we're not be able to stand to, to handle it so uh, uh, to me personally, this is what I'll say. I'll say that actually, if you see that something is wrong or somebody tells you that, okay, what you've done to me is not wrong. 
I think the best way is to address it. Yeah, because that could be a strategy that the devil might be using to get whatever circumstance, whatever situation. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think I think my personal, I think that is what I'll do. Uh, but also, I want to say this: uh, let us not be fault finders as Christians. Let us not be fault finders. That every time I sit in a crowd, I always want to look for people's own mistake and say, "Oh, you," because we ha I have to. Uh, 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 there's a passage I'm trying to paraphrase here. Uh, uh, or be because I have to, like I just talked about Galatians 6, to bear your burden. So I should every time I'm looking at your mistake and trying to correct your mistake, that is bearing your burden. No, we should also not be fault finders because when we become fault finders, then we are missing the mark. But also at the same time, do not do not just underrate or despise or let go small small issues like that because small issues like that they will build up, and 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 someday will not be good. I think. Like, uh, on, you know, not to be fault finder, just, you know, both the things you say go along with it, but I think that especially because there's sometimes someone may say something and there may be no bad intention or bad heart behind it at all, and we can perceive it as a way, and I think, uh, you know, those are times where we especially need to, to think and to pray, like, Lord, is there a reason I should even be upset about this or hurt about this? And um, so that, you know, I, I think a lot of times it's, you know, us, we have to think about, okay, you know, what, why should I even, why would I be upset about this, um, and kind of deal with it in our own hearts with the Lord privately, and then if it's still festering, you know, maybe that's the point where we seek and say, listen, and try to bring clarity to it with that person and addressing the matter. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I completely agree. everyone's different too like some right. people some people get over stuff very easy right. and some people someone may sign and say something terrible to someone and they'll just be like you know they'll, yeah. they won't bother them at all and the other people are very very sensitive right and uh so you know there's there's all you know people are all over the spectrum there Dave, if you want to say something sir i have passed away one time that said you know to be successful in church you need to have the heart of a baby and alligator skin. Wow. Because you, it, it is easy to take criticism and let it just get right to you. Mm -hmm. But the other the flip side of that is just what Zach was saying. Often, often people don't intend, they don't intend to be as critical as what they come across. And, and you know, it's easy to start conflict. It's a lot harder. It's a lot. It's a lot harder to put a, a conflict aside if you let it get to a certain point. You know, it's easier to stop early on. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Two, two more. Two more to go. So we're down five. Two more to go. <laughs>